Hello, my name is Connor Kester. I am the Director of Family Outreach here at Victory Lutheran Church. Thank you so much for checking out our channel today. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss a video. Now on to our sermon. Good morning, brothers and sisters, on, on this wonderful day. Um, well, I'm very glad to be here. I'm very blessed to be here. I'm really grateful to be here. And uh, it's uh, two weeks ago we, I preached again, and well, now I'm here again. And it's an honor, it's an honor um, to be here again. And last Sunday I wasn't here because I was preaching in my church in Mexico, right? And so three, three, weeks in, uh, three Sundays in a row, and it's a wonderful thing. So, we have been seeing series, right, uh, about the Word of God, and we are going to receive some words um, according to the series that we have been following uh, about ungratefulness, right? And as you already learned last week, we must be thankful to our Lord, not only because we have life, and He is the one that sustains us through it all, but also because when we pass through death in all of its forms, so let it be violence and abuse or maybe lies and a lot of other things. Um, the Lord helps us and usually He teaches different things, right? He teaches humbleness. He teaches trust. Trusting in God, of course, trusting in Him. Focusing on the important things, the value of life, and other things. The Lord is faithful. Amen? Well, the question is, if our Lord is faithful, then we know he is, why do we worry? Why do we, as baptized children of God, worry about our God and our surroundings? And, oh, will God help me, me and my, my family, in these times of trouble? Will, will we have enough food or enough um, clothing and everything to pass through the days? We are humans, and we worry about a lot of things. We have to survive in the world. To, we need to work, we need to feed our families, we, we need to pay taxes, go to school, develop, develop in social spaces that can cause us a lot of our anxiety. And trust me, I, I, even though I'm here talking to you and preaching to you, trust me, I, I, it's difficult for me to be with a lot of people. So it can cause a lot of anxiety, right? And that's normal. Um, we deal with the uncomfortable, uncor uncomfortable truths of daily life, right? Daily living. And as if that wasn't enough, on top of it all, we have to deal with our sin and the forces of darkness that are always lurking in the shadows, tempting us and discouraging us from the purpose that our Lord has given us. As individuals, but not only as individuals, but also as a community. What is the purpose that God has given us? Well, we have learned that the purpose that God has given us as people of God is to be His, to be His people that trust Jesus, loves each other, and thus together we are a light to the broken and dark world that we live in. That's the purpose that we have as a community and as individuals, as Christians, right? Our vocations as baptized children of God. But we also worry about what tomorrow will bring, right? And um, I'm not sure if you remember what our Lord says in the Gospels, right? Um, Do not worry, because I have overcome the world. I've quoted this in the past uh, sermon, and he tells us, right? Like, why do you worry? Do you see the birds that are flying here? And do you see these animals that I feed? How much more am I going to feed you and keep you alive, right? And how much am I going to take care of you? And honestly, brothers and sisters, I know I am Mexican, but I know you and even me, we together are experiencing um, this anxiety right now. Right, because all throughout this past election week, we have been bombarded with anxiety and worry about the future of your country, and we have so many worries and questions that are in our minds and in our hearts, and this prevents prevents us from concentrating and especially concentrating on the things that are important, like family, church, and work. You know, the things that really are the daily life of us. But 
above it all, we cannot concentrate on the most important things, which are the things from above, right? Loving God and loving others above all. Um, the thing is, these important things that are come from above are the things that can transform our world and can truly transform the, the, our surroundings. In the passage for today, this is what we found, right? This is what we can read, the prophet Elijah and the situation with the widow. And we can read about a situation that will truly ter terrify us greatly, the situation of poverty. But not just any kind of poverty, but it is a kind of poverty that I myself have seen uh, in my country, right? And even I have family there and we have passed through things also. This kind of poverty where it manifests itself in the lack of food, of earthly things, and even things that sustain our bodies and can threaten our life if we don't have those, right? So it threatens, threatens the, life, the lives of the people that are in pain. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Elijah, and out of the blue, he was commanded to go to Sarephath, which was a town in the ancient days. A town that was in Sidon, which is in the desert. God told Elijah that he was going to have a particular encounter. An encounter with a widow. And mind you, in those days, widows were not seen in a good light, right? They were seen less as people that were a burden to society. Why? Well, because women's worth uh, was understood in terms of their relationship towards the man of their lives, their hus husbands. So imagine a woman that has his husband deceased. It was, it was, of course, of lesser value, right? A widow was a person that could be um, an obstacle for society. And thus she will have a lower status, stat, status in society. Despite all of this, the Lord told to Elijah to go to this place and to have this encounter with a woman. And this sounds very Jesus-like, right? Christ-like, because Christ encountered people where they were, right? So God told Elijah to go where she was and encounter her. So he did as God commanded when Elijah arrived at the gates of the city, there she was, the poor widow that was gathering sticks. We don't know why um, it would probably be like for a person um, gathering sticks, right? But maybe we can imagine that it was like people gathering trash in the streets for their sustenance and, you know, gathering food in the trash and everything. It was something not... Um, Beautiful. It was something even shameful. Um, so Elijah came to her, and, and he did as the Lord told him to do. And he asked the widow to give him some food and water, as we already read. But there's a question for you. What did the widow reply to Elijah? We already read that the widow seemed to reply in a very... Discouraging, discouraging and worried sense, right? He tells Elijah that if she gave him some food, she and her son will perish. They would not have anything else to eat and so die, right? That's what the widow said. He was, she was like, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of this food that I have and cook it so that me and my son afterwards afterwards, uh, after eating, die, right? A very discouraging scene, a very discouraging thing to say, a really, really, really impactful thing because poverty for this woman was a daily thing that threatened her life. So what did Elijah said? First of all, isn't these brothers and sisters the worst scenario possible for a lot of us? not having anything to survive and be living on a daily basis basically on the mercy of God? A poor widow trying to survive the harshness, the harshness of a life in poverty, gathering trash in the outskirts of the city 
and not having a lot to eat, living every day as if it was the last day of her life. So, before saying what Elijah said, was the response of the widow justified? Yes, of course she was justified to say that. Yes, of course, because she didn't have anything else to give her son and, him, and, and to eat herself, right? Humanly speaking, it was justified. She was trying to survive poverty in a society where widows were considered as less than an average married woman, and of course, much less than any man. Some food for her and her son, and having that for their sustenance was a situation of life and death. But this is the thing. Although her response was justified, humanly speaking, the prophet Elijah wanted her to place her trust in the Lord. And we are told why the, we, and we are not told why the Lord sent this widow to feed Elijah. But the Lord said to Elijah, "I have sent a widow to feed you." Maybe the widow didn't even knew what she was going to do that day, and, and she didn't even knew she was going to have this encounter with a Christ-like figure like Elijah. But he did. But she did. She had an encounter with Elijah. And she was sent by God there in the gates of the city to gather sticks, not only to gather sticks, but to encounter this person, this prophet. So one thing we know, even if we don't know what, what, what was the purpose for, for all of this, we know that Elijah gave the, gave the widow words of law and words of gospel or good news, right? Right? He gave to the, to, the, to the widow promises. And with those words, the Lord fulfilled his promises to both Elijah and the widow. Even the family of the widow was taken care of by God. So Elijah commanded the widow to give her water and food. That is law, right? That is a command. Please give me water. Please give me food. The widow response was, of course, with this discouraging, and she was worried, which is something that the law does, right? A consequence of the law coming to the heart of the widow, a consequence of the word of God coming to our hearts. And then Elijah gave her promises, and I'm going to quote. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little, little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. And this next quote is the promise that, God, that Elijah, or God, through Elijah, gave to the widow. The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. You remember that at first, in the first sentences of the passage, we can read that it was dry, right? It was dry, there was no rain. So Elijah's response to the widow, the promise that he gave to her, was an adequate response. A response that was coming with a promise, the promise of providence, the promise of good news, the promise of the goodness of God and his love and mercy towards his people. Do not, feel, do, not, do not fear, said Elijah. Do not fear. Like Jesus said, says a lot, right? When, she, when he encounters people in the Gospels, we can read that he says, do not fear, do not fear. And in these words, Elijah confirms both the law, the commandments of God, and his good news to the widow. The good news of the providence of God towards his people. So the woman did as Elijah commanded, and the Lord proved his faithfulness towards his people by taking care of this widow that trusted the words of the Lord. Because it wasn't about her, her obedience. It was about God's love towards her. And this is wonderful, isn't it? I think it is very wonderful. And this is very comforting also, because... Maybe when we read the Old Testament, we tend to think or read as if uh, these kinds of things are just there, right? Then we don't pay attention to them. But the thing is, there's so much juice in this piece of Scripture, right? 
There's so much um, meat to be processing and thinking about because this is very important. God's providence, one of the most important promises that God has given to us, that he will provide. Not necessarily physical things, but we'll, we'll get there. So, how wonderful it is to see the providence of the Lord and his faithfulness even in the darkest of times. When we, when we think we're going to die, when we think we are in the mud, when we think we are in a big uh, and profound uh, well of despair and loneliness, He provides. So these passages show us, show us that God's mercy towards us and how He provides the necessary things are more than enough to trust Him. And again, it is not about doing something. It is about trusting Having faith is trust. It's not only believing that something exists, but it's trusting the object of faith. Trusting someone, trusting something. And in this case, we trust the Lord. The ones who trust the word of God produce the fruit of obedience, which in, in turn, the Lord shows his faithfulness. When we trust there is a fruit, the fruit of following His Word. His Word doesn't come void. He, the Word of God comes with a living act, the act of obedience. And in this case, what the widow did, right? She did some food for Elijah. But the thing is that even if we do not trust in the Lord, He remains faithful towards us. How does he remain faithful towards us? Even if we are not faithful? Even if we don't obey? Even if we don't say as the word of his, of as, as his holy word says? Well, he remains faithful in his son, Jesus Christ, in which we are complete, fulfilled, and satisfied beyond measure. And if you don't believe me, don't trust me. It's okay. Trust the word of God. We have seen that all throughout the series that we have been um, learning in, in the past Sundays. And I'm sure you, always, you also have seen the faithfulness of God in your own lives. I can say by myself that I've been seeing that too. And one of those, um, those examples is being here in front, of, in front of you. Being here for me is a, is, a, is a reminder of the faithfulness of God towards my life, towards my family, towards my church and towards my people because Mexico is not so um, gospel friendly, you know. So it's a beautiful thing to be here in front of you and I'm sure you can recall those moments when God has been faithful to you personally. The passage for today should convict uh, us of our sin, should show us our great unfaithfulness towards the Lord because we usually do not trust Him. We are the same as the widow. Of course, we have different situations and maybe some people are passing the same thing as the widow, unfortunately, and that's a reality of maybe 60% of the world or even more. But at the same time, it should be a passage about gospel, a passage about comfort. It should show us how in Jesus, in Christ, in our Christ, all promises of God are fulfilled because of his blood shed on the cross for us. And as I said before, Elijah is a messianic representation that comes in the name of the Lord to give the widow words of law and words of promise. Elijah is representing Christ in this passage. Elijah is representing our risen Lord coming to us and as a widow, giving us care and giving us providence and giving us words of comfort, gospel, and, and words of wisdom and of love. Words that encourage us to keep on on life, trusting Him. So, church, I'm going to finish with this. I know it's, it was a small message, but this is very important. Very, very, very important. Let Jesus 
be enough in your life. Let Jesus be your provider, sustainer, and savior in all the areas of your life. It is a true thing that his blood covers and cleanses you completely. You are in him and he is in you. And I know maybe this is like, how can I know that? Well, you are complete in him. And even if you feel far away from him, which all of us have experienced, always remember, Christ is king. And this king is the king of kings. Not any, not all, not any king. He is the king that invented the universe, that creator, the, created the universe. The one that has everything under control. And the best thing of all is that this king has decided to dwell among us. Pay for our transgressions and forgive us of all of our sins. And again, I know, I know these are times of trouble. And maybe you were, you, 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 you voted for one or the other. It doesn't matter. Because at the end, Jesus is king. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. And I know, I know, everything impacts our lives. We are so, so small. We are like ants in the universe. But... But that's a good thing because we can trust that it's not about us and it doesn't depend on us, but it depends on the mercies of God. No matter who is president, God is still faithful and God won't change his position towards you. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what side you, you lean on. God is still faithful to you. He loves you. He loves you. Let him be enough. Because he is enough. This is your Jesus. This is my Jesus. This is our Jesus. There's our uncertainty. There's uh, uncertainty for the future. We don't know what will happen. It can be good. It can be bad. Maybe both. Which will probably be both because that's how real life works. But. Even if we don't know how things will turn out, even if we don't know how the economy will turn out, even if we don't know how the social surroundings and, and, the, and the environment is going to turn out. Let Jesus be your song, your song that's, that whispers into your ears. In the world you will have troubles, troubles, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I forgive you. My blood is enough to cover you. I have you in my hands. I am in you and you are in me. And church, this is enough. Jesus is enough. So let us be grateful to God for his providence because he always provides even when we don't notice his blessings. So I encourage you. I encourage you and I encourage myself also. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. God has us. God has you your family, your friends, your church, this nation, and the whole world in his hands. And he will provide because he is always faithful, even if we are unfaithful to him, because he can, cannot deny himself. No matter who is the president, there is only one that sits on the eternal throne, which is Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.